Live from London, this is Global Business. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Juliet Mann. And I'm Paul Barber. Our top stories. Ticking up. Manufacturing in China hits a two-year high after a fourth consecutive month of growth. A historic landslide win in Mexico as the country elects its first female president. Unprecedented flooding in southern Germany. The death toll rises and thousands are forced from their homes with more weather warnings on the way. Shares surge in GameStop after a familiar investor announces a huge stake in the company. And driving demands in the world's largest auto market. China allocates hundreds of millions of dollars to stimulate trade-ins. More things are being made in China again as manufacturing hits a two-year high. Yes, factory output saw a fourth consecutive month of growth in May, with the Chaixin Purchasing Managers Index rising to 51.7. That's up from 51.4 the previous month. In the fastest acceleration in two years, and driven mostly by new orders. Well, Zhang Zhouwei is President and Chief, Executive, Chief Economist at Pinpoint Asset Management in Hong Kong. Part of that uh, strong growth is really coming from export sector, right? So the external demand seems to be quite strong, which has been driving uh, China's economy, uh, you know, so far this year. And this Taishin PMI, particularly if you look at the sample, you know, the, the, the type of firms that they survey uh, tend to be more uh, private enterprises that are located more along the coastal lines of China and more export oriented. So I, I think a big part of that is export driven. You talk about it being private enterprises, but this survey really does zone in on small and, and medium-sized firms. Do, do you think those are the real engines of economic growth or just a small part of a bigger puzzle? I would say uh, it is a very important part of the economy, probably the most um, uh, dynamic uh, with the, you know, the best potential. Um, and, um, you know, throughout the past 20, 30 years, that's really the most productive part of the economy. And, um, you know, they have been doing quite well um, moving up the value chain and, um, you know, all, also delivering jobs um, in, in an economy where, you know, unemployment rate is still uh, relatively high. So I, I think this is a very important part of the economy, although, as a, you know, the, the share of the uh, uh, GDP that comes from that part of the economy is, is not uh, dominant yet. You mentioned jobs. I'd like to pick up on that. What about jobs in the manufacturing sector? I mean, that reading was quite low. You know, what's the outlook there? I think it's gradually improving. Um, I think part of that is because of some of the um, sectors that are related to the property sector is not doing that well uh, because the property sector slowdown, um, you know, has been going on for for quite some time, and many of these developers are still in trouble. Um, and the situation there is just in the, I would say, at the very beginning of uh, stabilization, right? So um, property demand is not strong, then a lot of the related the sectors are not really recruiting people, um, including steel, cement, all these kind of uh, uh, suppliers to the, to the property sector. So that's probably where we need to do more to, uh, to, to stabilize things and start to generate jobs. Well, all of this is taking place against a pretty volatile outlook for global trade. Um, where do you see the opportunities for, for Chinese manufacturers in the short to medium term? I would say in the longer term, medium term. Um, <laughs> I think the exporters still have a lot of potentials. I think they are really quite competitive and they are, you know, climbing up the value chains. You can see particular cases in, in, uh, in many of the emerging markets that they are uh, building up um, production bases, uh, Vietnam, Mexico, and so on. So I, I do think they, they have a lot of potential to be developed. In the short term, you're right. I think the, the you know, the export orders can be volatile, and we already started to see some signs of slowdown in some of the economies, including U.S. So the exporters, I, I think they do need to be uh, aware of the potential risk of slower uh, the mass, uh, external demand in the coming months. There's no sign of an end to Turkey's rampant inflation. Latest figures show it hit 75% in May, the highest in over a year. Housing and food costs were key factors, but Finance Minister Mehmet Şimşek says the worst is over, claiming prices will start cooling later this year. 
Central bank chiefs have raised interest rates 10 times since last summer, from 8% to 50 in a bid to tame inflation. A three-year government austerity program is also underway. Chinese online fashion giant Xin is reportedly moving towards a staggering $60 billion float on the London Stock Exchange. Sky News reported the company is preparing to file a prospectus with the Financial Conduct Authority. If approved, it would be London's highest profile float in more than a decade. The chairman of Toyota has apologised for lapses in the certification process of some of its vehicles after Japan's transport ministry found irregularities in applications to certify their models. Toyota and Mazda halted shipments of certain cars after the companies were found to have submitted incorrect or manipulated safety tests. Global Airlines raised their profit forecast for 2024 and projected industry-wide revenues just shy of $1 trillion as a record number of travellers board flights. The International Air Transport Association, IATA, said it expected the worldwide industry to generate more than $30 billion of profit this year, higher than an upwardly revised $27.4 billion in 2023. Shares of British drug maker GSK have dropped more than 9% after 70,000 lawsuits related to its drug Zantac were allowed to proceed in the United States. The discontinued heartburn medication is alleged to have caused cancer. GSK says it disagrees with the ruling by the judge in Delaware. It's been a volatile day on the markets, with GameStop soaring in early trading before dropping back again. And it all came after a huge investment was announced on Reddit by an investor known as Roaring Kitty. Our correspondent, John Terrett, is in New York with the latest. Well, Roaring Kitty is truly roaring once again on Wall Street this morning. Real name, Keith Gill. He's the subject of the Hollywood movie Dumb Money, which I recommend highly to you if you want to understand what happened three years ago with the meme stock frenzy. When people at the height of COVID were in their basements, we think using government money to bet against the professionals on Wall Street. A lot of money was made. A lot of money was lost. There were congressional hearings to work out how it can be avoided in the future. Well, on Sunday, Roaring Kitty posted online evidence that he has a $116 million position in GameStop, including 5 million GameStop shares and other things as well. Now, Wall Street is assuming that this posting is accurate. And as a result of that, the GameStop shares and other meme shares are rising sharply on this Monday morning. Now, it was posted on the Reddit website, the online community, where Roaring Kitty, or Keith Gill, has another name. He's known as Deep Value. And the GameStop shares, before the open this morning on Monday, were ahead by about 80%. They're now, in the last hour or so, ahead by about 30%. And AMC, another meme stock, one of the cinema chains, global cinema chains, shares up 26% before the open and up 13% within the course of the last hour. About 35 million GameStop stocks have been traded in the early morning here on Wall Street. Wall Street professionals a little disconcerted to see that this has come back again at the height of a bull market, pretty much. We'll monitor it closely and see what happens. The other big story of the day on Wall Street involves microchips, and in particular AMD, Advanced Micro Devices, which is based in Santa Clara in California. Indeed, this story is entirely based in Santa Clara, California, because it involves NVIDIA and Intel as well. Really, there is only one game in town when it comes to making expensive, high-end AI chips, and that is NVIDIA. Intel is there, but AMD has a lot of catching up to do. And so in Taipei over the weekend, AMD announced its plans to build its own version of high-tech AI microchips. Uh, they say that AI is their number one priority. This is an exciting time and that AI will transform virtually every business. Well, also on Sunday, NVIDIA, great rival, came out and unveiled for the first time a new suite of AI chips. The new one is called Rubin, named after Vera Rubin, who is a U.S. astronomer, and will replace the existing very expensive Blackwell chips that NVIDIA makes, named after the statistician and the game theorist and the mathematician David Blackwell. All of this, as you might imagine, is driving AI-based chips up this morning on the stock market, NVIDIA by 3% before the open, up 2.5% within the last hour. Intel was up, but is now down 1.6%. And the same with AMD. Before the open, it was up 2%. It's now down about the same amount.
Guys, back to you. Exit polls in India suggest Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his ruling BJP are on course for a landslide win in the general election. And the country's stock markets appear to be rejoicing. Our correspondent Radhika Rajaj reports from Mumbai. Indian shares reached lifetime highs, the rupee gained and bond yields dropped as investor sentiment soared with expectations of continued economic growth with exit polls predicting a clear mandate for Prime Minister Narendra Modi's third term. The polls forecast Modi's Bharatiya Janata Party or the BJP and its allies to win much over the required two-thirds for majority in the 543-member lower house of the Indian Parliament. Now, the broader Nifty index closed 3.25% higher, hitting a record high of 23,338.7 during the session. Similarly, the BSC index uh, closed up 3.39%. Uh, in person terms, uh, this was the biggest single-day gain for both the Sensex and the Nifty 50 since 2nd January 2021. Now, on Monday, the rupee appreciated as well, nearly 0.4% against the dollar, marking its best single-day gain in over five months. Investor sentiment was also high on the back of better-than-expected FY24 GDP numbers that came in on Friday. The Indian economy grew by 7.8% in the March quarter, while the annual growth rate stood at 8.2%, according to the data released by the government. Now, a large BJP victory, if it's confirmed on Tuesday, is expected to sustain the bullish equity markets driven by economic growth. Analysts predict this could uh, prompt uh, foreign investors uh, who withdrew funds ahead of the election to actually reinvest. Now, an extended tenure could help this government to further bolster infrastructure spending and continue the push to develop India as a manufacturing hub, as well as bring in major land and labor reforms. Radhika Bajaj, CGTN, Mumbai. You're watching Global Business Europe. Still to come this hour, pressure mounts on all sides of the Israeli government over the latest Gaza ceasefire plan. Ever wondered what's the difference between a bear and a bull market? Where are the cash cows? And who are the lame ducks? And what exactly are black swans? Grey rhinos? And unicorn companies? Make sense of it all with Global Business, only on CGTS. I think it should be more global cooperation. I would like to hear more the voice of the developing countries. Globalization has lifted more than a billion people out of poverty. The green transition has to happen. It's, it's, it's a necessity. Well, China and, and the United States are, are important powers in the world. What unites us? is much more than what uh, divides us. And I believe China is committed to this agenda. Join me, Juliet Mann, to set the agenda at these times every weekend on CPTN. Events have consequences. Words create impact. One more offensive in a long line of battles that's been ongoing for more. Just gotta be careful here with some gunshots. Excuse us, excuse us. The world today matters for your world tomorrow. The number of casualties is growing quickly. Why, this is one of the hardest hit towns in the region. The world today, every day on CGTN. Welcome back to Global Business Europe. Israeli media are reporting that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says the first phase of an American-backed Gaza ceasefire plan could begin before the rest of the terms are fully agreed. But the truce proposal could be derailed by ongoing opposition from 
right-wing ministers of Israel's government. National Security Chief Itmar ben gvir has threatened to topple the coalition if the plan fails to include destroying Hamas. Well, earlier, there were some reports that said he would be meeting Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to discuss the proposal. Our correspondent Jonathan Regev is in Tel Aviv for us now. Jonathan, can Benjamin Netanyahu keep this coalition together while also keeping the United States happy as an ally? No, there's no, there's no choice of, of doing both things. It's either or, either going with this uh, proposal uh, and, and, and losing the coalition or keeping the coalition and losing the proposal. Benjamin Netanyahu will have to decide if he had any thoughts that perhaps the far-right ministers Itamar ben Gvir and Bezalel Smotrich would back him uh, even though they said time and time again that they would oppose any uh, kind of deal uh, of, of this kind. Then uh, today it became clear it will not happen. Both these far-right ministers uh, basically uh, putting out statements in the last few hours saying they completely oppose any agreement which uh, will not see the complete destruction of uh, uh, Hamas and uh, the, the, the agreement as it is proposed is something that they both, uh, uh, that they both simply oppose. They have uh, no, uh, no, no plans at all to back it and both, both of them said a government which will approve this kind of agreement is a government which we will not be a part of. Now Benjamin Netanyahu will have to decide on the one hand stand these two ministers Smotrich and Ben Gvir. On the other hand the American administration, the hostage families, a large part of the Israeli society and Netanyahu has to decide. Uh, we, we have to say that there have been a couple of crossroads in the past uh, eight months since this war began in which uh, Netanyahu had to decide between the international community, the hostage families and the far-right ministers. In all of them, all of them, he went with the far-right ministers. Um, right, so some really tense domestic politics there in Israel. Looking at the regional picture, Jonathan, Egypt is applying pressure on Israel, isn't it, over Gaza's Rafah crossing. What more can you tell us? That is correct. Another important uh, global player being uh, Egypt. On the one hand, uh, they're, they're putting pressure on Hamas to accept this deal. On the other hand, they're putting pressure on Israel to withdraw from uh, Rafah. The Rafah border crossing has been closed since Israel took over the region uh, about three weeks ago. And Egypt is saying it loud and clear. The Rafah border crossing is between Egypt and Gaza, not between Egypt and Israel. Therefore, we, the Egyptians, have no plans of reopening it with the Israelis on the other on the other side. If the, this uh, um, opening, uh, if, if we are set to open this uh, border crossing, we need a Palestinian partner on the other side. That Palestinian partner will surely not come in as long as the Israeli army is around. As far as the Egyptians are concerned, the Israeli army has to leave the area and do it quickly. All right, Jonathan. Many thanks for that update from Tel Aviv. That's our correspondent, Jonathan Regev. The United Nations Palestinian Refugee Agency says Israel's military operation in Rafah has forcibly displaced one million people. Our correspondent Akram al Satari reports from Khan Yunis. The humanitarian situation continues to be extremely dire. In the last one hour and a half or so, seven Palestinians were killed. Four of them were killed in East Rafah in Ashoka area and were taken to Gaza European Hospital. Three of them were killed in uh, west of Rafah in a Saudi neighborhood and were all taken to the field hospital nearby the area. Palestinians continue to struggle and as to the report subject of matter that has just been aired, the children in Gaza are bearing the brunt of the ongoing uh, war against Gaza. Three children were killed last night, 12 years old, 13 years old and 15 years old. They were having their dinner and they were cut into pieces by a missile that hit their home. They were taken to the field hospital. Their father was there with them. So they continued, children continue to be the main victims of the ongoing humanitarian situation that has been deteriorating because of the ongoing ground operations and because of the bombardment that has been devastating the life of the Palestinians. The food aid is not allowed into Gaza Strip. The minimum quantity of food aid that has been entering has been decreasing because of the also ongoing ground operations in different parts of Rafah and in different parts of all the Gaza Strip. So the situation is dire. There were some concerns raised by the Palestinian Minister of Health. Around 3,500 Palestinian children under the age of five are threatened of 
imminent death because of the famine and the starvation and because of the lack to the appropriate amount of food they need to have as children the elderly people are also at risk so this is part of the this is part of the image of, of the situation that has been taking place in Gaza and it continues to deteriorate because of the ground operations because of the bombardment and because of the blockade that has been strictly imposed on the Gaza Strip Mexico has elected its first female president in a historic landslide win. Claudia Sheinbaum, a climate scientist and former mayor of Mexico City, took close to 60% of the vote in Sunday's poll. She's promised to deliver a government without corruption or impunity. Sheinbaum will replace her mentor, outgoing president Andres Manuel López Obrador, on the 1st of October. Our correspondent Alistair Bavistock reports from Mexico City. Well, it's not only the country's first female president, but it's also the North American continent's first female president. The Mexico's first female president will now assume for a six-year term. And she's not only a very experienced politician, she's also a very experienced academic and environmentalist. She holds a PhD from Mexico's National Autonomous University in energy engineering. And she's also spent a lot of time as a politician on UN climate change panels, climate change, energy, these are issues facing Mexico. But number one at the polls and in the election for voters is security. Cartels and drug cartels, narco-trafficking cartels are a very serious issue in Mexico today. They are almost state-size institutions who terrorize individual areas. When drug trafficking, narco trafficking towards different areas of the country is clamped down on. Well, where do they look for profits? Well, they extort the local people. They kidnap local people. Historic levels of violence, and it is the number one issue for voters in Mexico. How qualified is Claudia Scheinbaum to tackle those issues? That's something that voters are still not very sure about. So that is, will be absolutely the way that she proves herself. If she, if she wants to be considered not only Mexico's first female president, but one of Mexico's great presidents. That was Alistair Bavistock in Mexico City. And Lucia K. Soloff is a freelance journalist based there in Mexico City. And I asked her a bit earlier about the significance of the election of Mexico's first female president. This is a very historic moment that we have our first uh, female president. Claudia was the mayor of Mexico City, um, and that has really changed the political landscape. Uh, even as you go through the streets of Mexico, you could see you see women's faces on all of the uh, political signs, which is something that you don't see in many other uh, countries. You know, and uh, but. Um, and women first got the right to vote in 1955. Uh, the suffragists who fought for that right to vote were still able to vote in these elections and say that it was a historic moment that they fought for the right to vote and never thought that in their lifetimes they would get to choose a female president. Um, so that's also historic. Also, uh, she won by a landslide. Uh, it's The full election results are still coming in of the exact uh, percentage, but it's somewhere between 58 and 60 percent of the vote. And uh, her rival, Xochitl Galvez, uh, from the coalition of the three other parties, the PRI, the PAN, and the PRD, um, they, uh, she got less than 30 percent. So uh, Claudia has had the most significant landslide victory um, in almost any elections in Mexican history. Once she is sworn in, can we expect Claudia Sheinbaum to continue the policies of her mentor, the incumbent president, López Obrador, under her leadership? Yes, I think she will largely continue many of his policies. Um, uh, she has a very different approach in how she speaks to people, how she relates, uh, and also comes from a very different background, uh, from an academic background, a scientist uh, here in Mexico City. Um, but she herself continually says that this is the next step of the fourth transformation, which is the part, the Morena Party's uh, political project, um, and that she will uh, continue both his policies on uh, more social programs for uh, Mexico's uh, poorest population, for rural populations, for young people. Also, um, there was increase of government benefits for senior citizens, uh, which has also really increased their support uh, for the Morena Party. Um, but also, she will continue with uh, many of the mega projects that he implemented that have really 
questionable uh, environmental impacts, or perhaps not even questionable, it is very clear that they have uh, very damaging effects for the environment. So, of course, the election results have raised these concerns about security with over 30 political assassinations during the campaigning. How do you see Claudia Sheinbaum addressing this? Um, well, she has said that she will focus on having a better intelligence and like a new government intelligence um, division and that would uh, further investigate organized crime. There are over 100,000 missing disappeared people in Mexico um, and where their uh, mothers are digging in hillsides looking for their children, hoping to find their bones. I mean, this is a really serious crisis. Um, and so what will be done about that? I don't think militarization is the answer. And she hasn't really put forth a, a full plan of how she will try to address these crises. Talks are underway to form a coalition government in South Africa after the ruling African National Congress lost its majority in last week's election. The ANC now controls 159 out of the 400 seats in South Africa's National Assembly, with its share of the vote falling to 40 percent. It now faces a power-sharing deal with the opposition Democratic Alliance. President Cyril Ramaphosa has called for unity and says the will of the South African people must be respected. The first votes are being cast in the European parliamentary elections, with polls opening early in Malta, Portugal and Estonia. Most of the EU's 370 million citizens will vote between the 6th and the 9th of June, with analysts expecting a boost for right-wing parties. Our correspondent William Densler reports. Support for far-right parties in Europe is taking off and could shake up the political landscape in Brussels. According to Politico's polling, the main conservative groups are set to gain some ground in the parliament. There are very important issues at stake, uh, for instance, uh, defence policy, how uh, to react to different uh, international security threats, how to boost the EU's uh, defence capacities, uh, especially regarding Russia. Voters across the 27 European member states will head to the polls to choose 720 members of the European Parliament. The number of MEPs is based on a nation's size. Germany has the most, with 96, while Malta, Cyprus and Luxembourg have the least, with six. People vote for a national political party, but most lawmakers choose to join transnational parties that are united by values rather than nationality. Don't take Europe for granted. Shape it and be it. And between the 6th and the 9th of June, don't let others decide your future for you. So go out and vote. There are currently seven political groups in Parliament, spanning the political spectrum. The centre-right European People's Party is currently the biggest, serving in a coalition with parties like Renew and SND. The European Parliament is just one of the three major EU institutions here in Brussels, but it's the only one whose members are directly elected by the public. The European Commission is the EU's executive branch. Its president, Ursula von der Leyen, is up for re-election. But voters won't see her name or other candidates' names on the ballot. Parliament has the power to approve or reject potential candidates. That means a stronger showing for a party in the polls means they have a greater say on who should get the job. Let's not miss the opportunity. This is our time, our chance to save Europe. And this is why I fight for a Europe which multiplies opportunity. I fight for a Europe of concrete solution. I fight for a more democratic Europe. The EU has changed a lot since the first elections were held back in 1979. At that time, just nine member states voted for 410 MEPs. Now people across 27 European nations will head to the polls to choose those that will help decide what path the EU takes for the next five years. William Denslow, CGTN, Brussels. Migration remains a key issue for a large number of voters in EU elections. Tens of thousands of people try to cross the Mediterranean each year, putting pressure on the countries they arrive in. Rokhaya Diallo is a French journalist and campaigner. She spoke to Jamie Owen about why anti-migration rhetoric is resonating in France. There is a, a fear, an irrational fear of the, what they call the great replacement. The idea that uh, people are willingly coming from Africa uh, to replace the original 
white European population in Europe and that they are organized in that purpose. And um, it echoes the fact that France is changing. It's been changing for a while. Like, I'm French. I've been French. I've, I was born here 45 years ago, and my parents were, fl were French also. So it's something that people were not ready to see. And when they see someone like me claiming Frenchness, um, they have the feeling that they are deprived from something that belongs to them. And the, the fact that we are facing so many economical and financial fa challenges make people think that what they what um, they should have is given to immigrants and who, to people who look like immigrants as I do. I'm, I'm not an immigrant but I'm perceived as an immigrant by many of my fellow citizens. And um, the, national, the national rally plays on that uh, feeling which is xenophobic. How big is racism in France? Is it just playing out on social media or is it a part of everyday life? Uh, it's very, it's very big. Like as a public figure, I get threats and insults every day. Like there is not a day I go on my social media without saying, seeing someone threatening me, telling me I should go back to to, to Africa, uh, saying, you know, saying I should die, or just uh, insulting me as a black woman and black and Muslim woman. As a French woman living this, how does that feel? Um, I don't really feel safe um, here uh, because um, I've seen my name in uh, social media groups of neo-Nazis who were saying that, uh, you know, just targeting specific uh, public people uh, of color or from the left that should be killed. So I know that I should be careful uh, because some people are serious with those threats. Um, but at the same time, I feel that it's my country and that I should, I should fight for it. I should fight for it to be diverse, to be what it is and to, to, to be what France stands for. Is this debate about immigration in France roaring because of the flatlining economy? When you can't face, uh, you know, the situation economically, you have to find a scapegoat. And it's very easy to say that uh, the immigrants are the reasons why uh, the country is uh, struggling financially. So I think it, it plays a large part, and that like the far right parties don't have a program. They, they have nothing. If you really dig, dig into what they plan, they have no plan besides closing the borders, kicking immigrants out of the country, and it's not sustainable. But that works because people feel like that they, they are deprived of resources. So they think that if we uh, deport uh, immigrants, they will, ha they will have access to those resources instead of focusing on people who benefit, who benefit the most from globalization, they focus on other people who are also struggling. What does France look like if the far right does well in these elections? I think that if far right does well, we will see more and more public racist discourses because people will interpret their victory as uh, the sign that racism helped uh, winning an election. So we will see more and more politicians using that strategy to gain votes and, and to convince voters. You can see more of our coverage of the far right in Europe later this month in a new two-part documentary. We're looking at how unauthorised immigration has been used by right-wing politicians as a way to win votes. You can find it soon on CG10 Europe's YouTube channel. Well, right-wing parties are not tipped to do well everywhere. In Spain, polls suggest that the Socialist Workers' Party, known as the PSOE, could win the most votes. Across the bloc's 27 member states, voters will elect 720 MEPs, all of whom can sit for a five-year term. Within the parliament, they join together in broad political groupings. Well, Spain's PSOE is part of the Progressive Alliance of Socialists and Democrats, which currently has a total of 139 seats. It's also the party of Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez, which makes up the ruling coalition along with the left-wing Sumar party. There have been questions over Sanchez's future in the run-up to the elections, as he considered resigning over a corruption probe into his wife's business. Our correspondent, Siobhan McCall, has more. Pedro Sanchez has often been described as a quick thinker and a skilled orator. Let's take a look at how he comes across on social media. 
Well, Sanchez has become known as a bit of a risk taker, and so far it's paid off. Last year, he called a snap general election after his party performed badly in regional polls, and he ended up getting a new term. Spain's leader has won a lot of praise for his speeches. When the country recognized the state of Palestine, he delivered the speech in both Spanish and English and is the first Spanish prime minister to be fluent in English while in office. With a PhD in economics, he could be seen as highly qualified to run the country's finances. But Sanchez is also nicknamed El Guapo, or the handsome one. He made this appearance on Morning Joe in the United States, and some viewers dubbed him Spain's JFK, a reference to the late U.S. President John Kennedy. It's thought that around 30% of young men in Spain identify with parties from the right and extreme right. And Sanchez has been using his platform to deliver passionate speeches like this, calling on voters to see being left-wing as progressive. And targeting the youth vote has also become a key persoy strategy. They are embracing online trends, and this raccoon meme, accompanied by Italian hit song Pedro, is a big symbol of their European election campaign. Back to you, Juliet and Paul. Thanks, Siobhan. So let's get more from Spain ahead of the elections. Our correspondent, Ken Brown, is in Madrid. Well, that's the multi-million euro question. Participation in these elections has traditionally been very low. In 2019, practically half of Europeans didn't even vote. Spain's Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez knows that these elections work a little like the U.S. midterms. Voters often use them to punish sitting governments. But Mr. Handsome, as we've heard some supporters call him, isn't just a pretty face. He pulled off a real Houdini act. Uh, when faced with a wipeout last year following awful local election results, he risked early general elections in July. Now he's prime minister for another term. His European election strategy is similar, framing the centre-right and the far-right as the same thing. Sanchez always bet big. Look at the corruption investigation against his wife. He said it was far-right lies and took five days out to decide on continuing as prime minister or not. He stayed on and what happened next? His party won the most votes in the Catalan elections. Most recently, he's used the diplomatic spat with Argentina's firebrand president, Javier Millet. Sanchez uh, uh, recalled Spain's ambassador. Millet exploded, insulting Sanchez, insulting his wife. And again, Sanchez uses this. He says, look, this is what the right is. Extremists who want to remove rights and dismantle Europe's post-World War II welfare state. So... Sanchez, his favorite sport is basketball. He, he knows how important it is to keep possession, to keep the ball. He's been on top of the news cycle for weeks now uh, between the five-day timeout, leading Spain's official recognition of Palestine as a state, Millet. So while Spain's right wing uh, as a block does lead the polls right now, watch out for Spain's comeback king, Pedro Sanchez. You can get highlights from this week's news in Europe and China. Direct your inbox from CGTN's Storyboard email newsletter. Sign up at europe.cgtn.com slash newsletter. Stay with us. Coming up on the programme, more weather warnings ahead in Germany after unprecedented flooding forces thousands of evacuations. What do we mean? When we talk about the difference, Brazen the difference is in the detail, in the background, defense ministers from the wider angle and perspective of every story, wherever the story may be. CGTN. See the difference.
stay connected. Welcome back to Global Business Europe with Paul Barber and me, Juliet Mann. The headlines again. Ticking up, manufacturing in China hits a two-year high after a fourth consecutive month of growth. An historic landslide win in Mexico as the country elects its first female president. Shares surge in GameStop after a familiar investor announces a huge stake in the company. At least two people have died and several others are missing after heavy, heavy flooding in southern Germany. Thousands of homes have been evacuated, with some areas seeing a month's worth of rainfall in just 24 hours. Our correspondent Natalie Carney reports. Entire towns and villages have been flooded, particularly along the Danube and its tributaries. In many areas, water levels still remain well above level four, which is the highest reporting level. 13 regions have declared states of emergency, including the Bavarian city of Regensburg, where water levels in the Danube River reached 5.8 meters. That's nearly 20 feet. Thousands of people have been evacuated, while others have been asked to abandon the ground and first floors of their homes and move to higher levels. Highways have been closed. Train services across southern Germany have been disrupted. As well, many schools are not in active class in the affected areas. In some instances, air rescue teams have had to rescue people from balconies and rooftops. According to the Bavarian Premier Marker Zodor, almost 40,000 forces from the fire brigade, police, the German Red Crescent, the Technical Relief Agency and the Army have been deployed since the beginning of the flooding here. Support is also coming from the neighboring federal state of Baden-Württemberg. With enormous financial damage expected, Zodor has called for help from the federal government, saying the water may not stay for long, but the damage is long-lasting and enormous. Three years ago, parts of Germany and Bavaria were also devastated by flooding that left hundreds dead and thousands of homes destroyed. Today, many are asking, why hasn't anything been done to improve these situations? While thousands have come together to help this situation, meteorologists warn of further rainstorms with parts of the Danube still expected to peak in the days to come. Natalie Carney for CGTN in Reitertofen, Bavaria. Well, the flooding coincides with climate talks taking place in the German city of Bonn. The gathering is seen as a halfway marker towards the next UN climate change conference known as COP29 in Azerbaijan. Our correspondent Peter Oliver reports. Some 6,000 people from 198 countries are in Bonn for this climate conference and addressing those delegates. UN climate boss Simon Steele said getting the finance in place for climate positive projects was key. We must make serious progress on finance, the great enabler of climate action. Here in Bonn, I urge you to move from zero draft to real options for a new, collective, quantified goal on finance. 
The first session was brought to an early end as protesters waving a Palestinian flag refused to leave the stage. Dear delegates, as the people are not willing to leave the floor as I requested several times, there is no other option for me than to suspend the meeting. This conference has kicked off on the same day as the German expert council on climate change said Berlin is unlikely to hit its 2030 targets for greenhouse gases. This contradicts statements we heard from the German government back in March saying that they were on track for their ambitious 2045 carbon and climate neutrality aims. Peter Oliver, CGTN, Berlin. The Speaker of the Georgian Parliament has signed a divisive so-called foreign agents bill into law. It comes after lawmakers voted last week to dismiss a presidential veto. The law requires organisations receiving more than 20% of funding from outside the country to register as foreign agents. It's provoked weeks of protests with critics saying it will curb media freedom and jeopardise Georgia's chances of joining the European Union. Hundreds of Spanish farmers have blocked a highway at the border with France, echoing protests that were seen in many countries earlier this year. Farmers say the EU's agricultural policies and climate action plan are unfair and impractical. The demonstration comes just days after those European parliamentary elections we've been talking about. Nigel Farage, the politician who helped champion Britain's exit from the European Union, has announced that he will stand in the country's upcoming general election. Farage had originally said that he would not take part, but will now stand as an MP and take over as leader of Reform UK, which is formerly called the Brexit Party. Former Pakistan Prime Minister Imran Khan has been acquitted on one of his convictions, but will remain in jail due to a separate case. His guilty verdict for leaking state secret was overturned by a high court after he was sentenced to 10 years in February. Khan will continue serving a seven-year sentence following a prosecution relating to the marriage to his third wife. The electricity grid in Nigeria has crashed and airports have shut down as thousands of union workers stage a strike. The move is in response to the government's failure to agree on a new minimum wage. Union members reportedly drove operators from the control rooms of power stations while airlines suspended flights. The indefinite strike is the fourth since a new president was sworn in last year. China has allocated $890 million to subsidize auto trade-ins this year, a move geared at driving demand in the world's largest car market. Each car owner who scraps an oil vehicle for a new one could get a one thousand dollar bonus well chinese automakers are defying the ev industry slump with strong deliveries in may neo delivered more than twenty thousand new vehicles that's two hundred and thirty percent up on last year zika also which recently went public in the united states delivered more than eighteen thousand new cars reflecting a one hundred and fifteen percent increase from the previous year and leap motor also delivered over 18,000 new cars, a 50% year-on-year increase. And in the fast lane, Lee Auto delivering more than 35,000 units in May. Our correspondent, Zhu Zhu, reports from its factory in eastern China. Here, a car is made every 40 seconds. 90 new cars roll off the production line every hour and 1,800 cars are made every day. Today I got the chance to visit the largest manufacturing base of Li Auto right here in Changzhou, Jiangsu province. Wow, these two huge robotic arms are kind of doing the dancing there. The robots are applying adhesive to the entire panoramic sunroof. The precision is within one millimeter, and the entire coating and installation process only takes 50 seconds. After all of these cars are produced for such new energy vehicles, how can they ensure the production accuracy of all those electric appliances inside? Well, they will go through an intelligent inspection system. This is a central control screen. The changing data shows the intelligent inspection system interacting with the cloud server to verify the car's electrical functions. 
So it is kind of like the car is checking itself by itself. 对，就比如说现在这这个玻璃它是自动升降的。For example, it can monitor the up and down movement of the windows, checking the precise positions of the lowest and highest points. Previously, they needed to use a handheld device to connect to the cars. They required around 10 workers per car for inspection. Now it's all unmanned. 显示的都是中文，对。You can see everything is in Chinese. It means it's all developed by us. Thanks to the advanced manufacturing industry clusters in the Yangtze River Delta, about half of Li Odo's suppliers are from the region. In Changzhou, we have about 20 main suppliers, including for glass, batteries, and seats. The proximity reduces costs and increases production efficiency. The rapid growth of smart manufacturing is enhancing the high-quality development of the Yangtze River Delta. Among the 45 national advanced manufacturing clusters announced by the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology, the delta accounted for about 40 percent of the total. Jiangsu Province leads with 10 clusters, ranking first in the country. Zhu Zhu, CGTN, Changzhou in Jiangsu Province. A record number of international students are applying to study in Australia, and most of them are from China. They bring significant benefits to the country's economy. But the government is worried about the impact on long-term migration, and says it wants to bring in new limits. Our correspondent Greg Navarro reports. University of Sydney graduate Amy Lee says Australia topped her list when choosing a country for her studies a few years ago. It's a multicultural. Nation, and I, I kind of like that. Today, nearly half of the students at the University of Sydney are from overseas. Nationally, there have never been so many international students in Australia. More than 700,000. More than a quarter come from China. They have such a positive impact on Australia's economic activity. Vicky Thompson is the chief executive for the Group of Eight, which is comprised of Australia's leading research-intensive universities. Half of Australia's economic growth last year. Was on the back of international students. Australia's government considers education to be one of its most lucrative exports, worth tens of billions of dollars. It's also concerned about the surge in overseas student numbers. The federal government plans to limit the number of international students to help reduce migration. It's already implemented tougher visa rules to crack down on the sector from being used as a pathway for work visas. Australia's international student migration program, in effect. Is a guest worker program. University of Sydney Associate Professor Salvatore Babonis believes the problem is more common among lower-ranked universities and education providers. Most of them are here to get a work visa, and the price of getting your work visa is that you have to pay tuition to some institution in order for them to process you, because the waiting time for a work visa can be three, four, five years. The waiting time for an education visa is typically two or three weeks. The cap on overseas students is also aimed at easing stress on the rental market, which is experiencing soaring prices and record low vacancy rates. In the capital cities, international students account for more than nine percent of all rental apartments. That's an incredible number. I mean, again, in context, that the、uh, the vacancy rate is under one percent. In Sydney, it tends to be around 0.7 percent. Advocates say all of the attention being focused on Australia's international education sector at the moment is beginning to have an impact beyond the country's shores. We are already seeing a slowdown in our visa lodgements and applications.、Uh, I think the latest data I saw was in March. So some of the messaging is already hitting the road in terms of students making choices. Thompson says Australia already competes with several countries to attract international students, and the fees they pay here are critical to funding university research. If approved, the government's caps on international student numbers will take effect at the beginning of next year. Greg Navarro, CGTN, Sydney. Italian scientists say their role in China's latest moon mission is the culmination of a decade of collaboration. Yes, the Chang'e 6 touched down on Sunday, aiming to make history by bringing back the first ever samples from the lunar far side. Our correspondent Hermione Kitson reports. <laughs> It's in this high-security lab in the Italian capital, where some of the country's top scientists test and perfect state-of-the-art technology crucial to China's next moon mission. Very exciting, also because we are now at the culmination of、uh, almost ten years of、uh, collaboration with、uh, with China. It was a long process, and it's finally the time in which、uh, we see an Italian-European retroflector on the moon. 
A retro reflector is essentially a small array of mirrors used to reflect laser beams which measure distance. They accurately position satellites, landers and rovers down to a millimetre. This one is called INRI and will be part of the Chang'e 6 mission. The size of the various micro-reflectors depends on their positioning. The bigger the distance between the satellite and the laser station, the bigger the reflector has to be. Retro reflectors have been used since the Apollo era, but those created in the 60s were three times bigger and ten times heavier and can only be measured directly from Earth. Instead, the, the miniature instruments we are now we have developed since 2015, we are delivering for these Chinese uh, lunar missions. Uh, they need to be measured, observed with lasers orbiting the moon. Like previous missions, Chang'e 6 will collect samples. In 2020, its predecessor scooped up 1.73 kilograms of material from the lunar near side and brought it back to Earth. The next mission will have an even more ambitious objective, to collect the first ever soil and rock samples from the moon's mysterious far side. It will also carry scientific experiments from France, Sweden and Pakistan. The location will be the South Polatkin Basin, which is the largest, deepest and oldest basin recognised on the moon. Experts say samples from there could provide new insights into lunar history and the difference in rock composition between the two sides. So this is the dream of every geophysicist and geologist uh, who wants to explore uh, the moon. So we are part of a one-of-a-kind mission. An unprecedented mission attempting a big leap in the global space race. Hermione Kitson, CGTN, Rome. The headlines again. Manufacturing in China hits a two-year high after a fourth consecutive month of growth. An historic landslide win in Mexico as the country elects its first female president. And shares surge in GameStop after a familiar investor announces a huge stake in the company. And that's it for Global Business Europe. Thanks for watching. Coming up next on CGTN, it's Africa Live. But we'll see you again tomorrow, same time, same place. From all the team here in London, goodbye. Bye-bye.